Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, joint workshop with uh, the Lewiston City Council and the Lewiston Planning Board. Uh, the first item on the agenda for this is the presentation of the 2021 Lewiston Capital Improvement. Uh, welcome, everybody, and welcome staff that's here. And, of course, our Sun and Journal watchdog. <laughs> I like that. Is that on the agenda? All right, so first item on the agenda is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So agenda item number one, the uh, 2021 capital improvement presentation. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, thank you very much. I'd be glad to um, lead this off. Um, basically, as I think everybody's aware, we're required on an annual basis to present a five-year capital improvement plan for consideration by the council uh, and for recommendations from the planning board and the finance committee. This is um, really designed to kind of lead into the overall city budget process so that you have capital information in front of you as you get into that process and so that that can be worked through at the same time we're looking at the operating budget. So this is a <clears throat> proposal and a plan, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> not necessarily the actual act of appropriation. That comes much later in the process. So when you see numbers tonight for anticipated capital needs in the current first year, those will be worked through the budget process, and I guarantee you that will look different as a, at the end of the process than it does today at the beginning of the process. So st with that starting, I think Heather is going to push the buttons for me. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Five-year plan calls for a total of $155 million in projects, of which $138 million would come from city resources. Those seem like pretty staggering numbers, but I'll point out that those are actually down somewhat from last year, where we started with $167 million in projects and $140 million in city resources. This chart kind of breaks it down by area. So you can see that the uh, top one is city bond issue, where we're looking at least for the first year, the proposal is $9.7 million. City operating budget is a small contribution. The school bond issue would be for 1.1 million. Water bonds for 2.1. Water operating for 525 and so on down the line. And we'll get into each of those in a little bit more detail. That would be for the first year of the plan. The second column shows the total over the five year period. And again, these numbers are a little bit lower than the numbers we started with last year. This chart shows proposed bond issues, and I'll point out a couple of big numbers that jump off, off that screen right away. If you look at fiscal 2022, you see $29.5 million in uh, proposed bonds for the city. That includes a number of major projects. It includes phase two of the Lincoln Street parking garage at $12.7 million, $2.5 million for the police department building, in anticipation of a potential expansion uh, to that property, plus renovations and improvements to the existing structure. And the second of our three uh, fire substation replacements, this would be the Main Street Fire Station at 5.7 million. In 2023, you'll see that the school department is asking for almost 3.8 million. About three and a half million dollars of that is for the middle school heating, ventilating, air conditioning, uh, upgrades and replacement project. So that's the biggest amount that's, uh, that's indicated in that part of the project. This simply shows it graphically. And again, you can see that big jump in 2022 for the reasons I mentioned earlier. In 2024, um, there's another jump in what we're anticipating first because we're looking at the third um, substation replacement in that year, that would be the, the Lisbon Street sub fire substation. 
And there's also an increase that year in, in CSO funding because that is the year that we would be looking at uh, potentially beginning to uh, come up with the funding necessary to put in a large storage tank near the treatment plant on the river that would allow us to capture overflow quantities in our sewer system in wet weather, hold it in the tank, and then feed that into the plant so that we're not overboarding that material into the river uh, as part of our combined sewer overflow requirements that uh, are part of our agreements with DEP and, e and EPA. This chart shows our outstanding debt that's been issued and authorized as of uh, December 31st. You can see here again, this is, is what we already have out on the books. Uh, note that the school amount of 73 million, which is the largest single category, that 40, 52, 53 million of that is guaranteed in effect by the state of Maine. That's for school expansions that have been done or new schools that have been constructed. So for example, um, the Martell School prop replacement project that, uh, that we just recently did is in there as well as several other school projects. Water, sewer, and stormwater, those funds are all covered by user fees. So <clears throat> users of the system, people pay their water bills or their sewer bills or their stormwater bills also cover the debt service associated with that. And the TIF special revenue funds, those are covered by TIF revenues usually tied, in fact, always tied to some form of a development project. The largest of those is the Walmart TIF. Uh, a good chunk of that goes also towards supporting our economic development uh, office. Authorized and unissued, you can see there's a significant amount of money there that we have not yet issued. The way we handle our bonds, they're authorized at a certain point, but we may not issue that, that debt for some period of time. We issue it as needed, so when a project actually gets to the point that we know it's going to be constructed within a relatively short period of time, that's when we'll actually go get the bonds. That way we're not borrowing in advance of need. That keeps us uh, straight with the IRS. Uh, the IRS does not appreciate people borrowing money in advance and sitting on it. They want you to spend it within a couple of year periods. So we try to time our issuance to our actual spending requirements. Debt service as a percentage of the city budget. Um, a few years ago, this number on the city side was in the low 20s, was in the 22, 23% range. So we've managed to bring that down over time. The school percentage is 9.5, so on a, on a mixed total basis, about 12.5% of our operating budget, school and city, goes to debt service. Um, that's not an unreasonable amount, it's uh, manageable. I think we'd all like to see the city side be somewhat lower than it is, and that's something that we've been working at over time, but it's getting more and more difficult because of some of the deferred major projects that we're now seeing show up, like fire station replacement, the needs of the police department building, either just to, just to get back to, to regular standard operating conditions or expansion, and some of the other projects that are pending. This chart, this is Heather's favorite chart. <laughs> this shows what we've been able to do in terms of debt service on the general fund. Starting with 2005, which was kind of the peak of the city's uh, debt, outstanding debt. And you can see two things from this chart. The first is that we've managed to bring down our outstanding uh, principal and interest from close to or a little over $100 million down to something closer to 56. 55 million, somewhere in that range. You can also see that we've dramatically brought down the amount of that in more recent years that's going toward interest payments. So we have really managed to reduce the amount of interest we're paying largely for two ways, three ways, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Little bit. Refinancing at a lower interest rate, um, shortening our term on repayment, so instead of running out for 20 years, doing it for seven or 10 years, uh, and really trying to manage the issuance of our debt to try to keep that all manageable. This next chart is a variation on that chart and tends to show the same trend. 
This basically looks as at our outstanding principal and interest as a percentage of the city's overall state adjusted value. Our state adjusted value is the state's estimate of what the total market value is of all property in the city of Lewiston that's taxable. So as you know, our uh, assessments are about 80% of market. So this is an adjustment of our assessed value to what the state feels our actual 100% uh, uh, market value would be. This in effect shows, I think, it's kind of a, of a debt to value ratio, uh, debt owed to, to total value of, or total um, income that, people, that a community has. And you can see we've managed to bring that down. We hit a low point of 1.9 percent. It's gone up a little bit over the last few years, as you saw in the other chart. But I think it's shown a pretty significant reduction in the ratio of our assets in effect to our liabilities in a very simple way. The other would probably object to some of my simplic simplicity yeah. there. But it gives us a measure of how we're doing overall in value versus debt. As I started to mention earlier, debt management, we've done a number of things. A number of years ago, uh, back in the days when uh, Mayor Kayer was the council president, we lowered what then was a 97% uh, debt authorization limit to 80%. What that means simply is on an annual basis, we look at the amount of principal that we've repaid, do that over the last three years and average that amount, and then we take 80% of that and that's the debt limit that we're looking at for how much to authorize in the, in the subsequent year. That debt limit can be waived, uh, but it takes a supermajority vote of the, of the city council. We've also refinanced debt when possible. I think uh, we did one refinancing last year but I think we've about run out the string on that. Most of our debt has been refinanced. That's outstanding. Most of it's been refinanced at a relatively low interest rate. Uh, it's always possible that the interest rates can go even lower. It's kind of the, the way the economy has been working in recent years is kind of mysterious to a lot of us. So we'll just have to keep our eye on it, but it's unlikely we'll have much opportunity to do refinancing in the future. We have wanted very much to move recurring expenditures into the operating budget. There are certain things that we do every year that recur. For example, regular street paving, overlays of, of streets, vehicle replacement, things like that that happens every single year. Those items would preferably be funded through an annual appropriation from the operating budget as opposed to borrowing the money. If you borrow $2 million a year to paved streets, you end up after a 10-year period, if you're on a 10-year repayment cycle, paying, you know, it ends up costing you something like $2.2 million a year to do $2 million worth of work. Uh, so we'd like to get that into the operating budget. It's been impossible, number one. During the period we're coming out of the recession, we simply couldn't uh, come up with much, uh, almost no capital in our operating budget. That was compounded by reductions in state revenue support for the city, particularly revenue sharing. And since then, we've been struggling, as you all know, trying to maintain a reasonable tax rate. Um, our tax rate is on the high side. And so it's always a battle and a balance between what, what we want to put on the individual taxpayers in a given year and what we want to do in terms of capital borrowing to spread that out over time. Um, and then finally, use of unallocated fund balance. That has been very successful. We've done a lot of that to meet our capital needs. And we'll get into that in a lot of detail February 2nd or whatever it is when we have the audit. And we find out what our un undesignated fund balance is. But we have been using undesignated fund balance in accordance with the council's policy of uh, keeping a minimum of 8% 8, 8 and a maximum of 12% of our um, revenues effectively in fund balance and using any excess to try to bring down some of the capital projects we're trying to cover. <clears throat> so we'll get into that obviously in much more detail when we get into the budget process. This chart shows our future year debt service requirements and as you can see, it declines fairly quickly. 
Uh, it is somewhat misleading in that this covers only existing debt. So as we go through this, new debt will be issued, so those numbers will increase or go up in later years. But it does show how quickly we're paying off our debt. We're going from $8.5 million in the current year down to 3.6 on 3.7 on existing debt in the fifth year of the cycle. Uh, there's one, a couple big drops in there, one of them between 21 and 22. We pay off our pension obligation debt. Um, <clears throat> that's debt that we borrowed, the city borrowed 20 years ago, 15? Uh, probably closer to 20. 15 or 20 years ago to pay off unfunded uh, debt obligations or pension obligations that the city had incurred uh, as a part of the main state retirement system. It is something that a lot of municipalities did because for a number of years the state actuarial studies were inaccurate. Uh, some suspects purposefully so to keep expenses down. And at the end of that process when they finally did a, an honest actuarial study, it became clear that the state had underfunded pensions both at the state level and also at the municipal level. Unlike the state, a lot of municipalities went out and borrowed that money because it's less expensive, it was actually less expensive to pay interest to, a, to someone we borrowed from than to pay the interest we would have had to pay to the state retirement system. So it was a better deal, it saved us money over time, but it was very powerful, it was very painful to have to borrow money uh, due to a liability, an unfunded liability that had been built up outside of the control of the local municipality. So we're getting close to having that off the books. It'll be nice to see that gone. And certainly we hope that doesn't ever happen again. Now we want to take a little bit closer look at what's on the schedule or what's being proposed for the coming year. So I'm going to run through the projects and, and talk a little bit about some of the ones that you may want to pay attention to. On the airport side, first off, uh, most of those projects are split 50-50 between the city of Lewiston and the city of Auburn. It's basically how we fund the airport is on a 50-50 basis. The one exception to that is the airport master plan update where the majority of that is paid by the Federal Aviation Administration through a grant. So they pay the vast majority of that and we just have to pay, come up with a small local share. On the transit committee, uh, that, that funding is primarily for replacing buses. We have historically for many years funded uh, bus replacement at $50,000 a year. That allows us to build up enough funding over time and Auburn does the same thing so that when a bus, when we can buy a bus, we have the local funds available to come up with that. A bus these days, Dennis? Uh, approximately $400,000. Bus costs about $400,000, so uh, it's a considerable amount of money, and having that money available is important because we don't always know when, when buses are going to, when funding is going to be available from the feds for buses. Sometimes you just hear about it all of a sudden, or sometimes the state will let us know that they have some extra money through federal funding, and we want to be able to take advantage of that. We're doing that now to buy two or three uh, new buses in the coming cycle. Assessing for the third, fourth year running yes. is looking for funding to do a citywide revaluation. This is something that uh, Bill Healy should talk to you about during the budget process. We are, as noted, at 80% or so in terms of our uh, ratio of assessment to market value. He would like to bring that in line to the, uh, bring that up closer to 100%. That has the counterbalancing effect of lowering the tax rate. <clears throat> so where our tax rate now is, say, $28 per thousand, if we were at 100%, it would be closer to $23, $24 per thousand. So there's a little bit of a psychological problem with a tax rate of $28 versus a tax rate of $24. Not that a tax rate of $24 is all that great, but it certainly is much closer in line with some other comparable cities such as, as Auburn and Augusta. Oh yeah, the red on the schedules is the lo is our share, the city of, of Lewiston's share. And it's scheduled for bonding. And it's scheduled for bonding, right, excuse me. Go ahead. Oh, next one, okay. 
Some of the projects worth noting here are the canal ownership projects. That's something that we're just starting this year to begin on. We got control of the canals two years ago. And this year there was some funding to allow us to begin doing some cleanup work along Smart Payne Park. This funding would allow us to continue to do some work and improvements on that stretch of the canal, kind of as a, an example of what we think could be done elsewhere in the canal system to try to improve its amenity of value and make it a, a, a more of a positive for the community, as opposed to something that's hidden behind chain link fences and overgrown, uh, poor uh, quality plantings. Riverfront Island implementation. This is again something that's been ongoing for a number of years. In particular, this project tied with what we already, some funding we already have would be designed to continue the improvements we started at Lincoln Street and ran over into the park down to the pedestrian bridge over into Auburn so that we would have a much nicer entryway into the park and some improvements all the way through that are consistent in their appearance. Oxford Street parking lot, this is some land that the city owns on Oxford Street that we would like to make into a parking lot to meet some of the existing and growing parking demand coming out of the Bates Mill Complex. Um, it's not necessarily that this would be permanently parking, but it would certainly meet needs for a short period of, for a, I'd say an intermediate period of time until uh, we dealt with the parking issue either on a larger scale through, par through an additional parking garage or we had some kind of development interest in that lot. So this would allow us, I think, somewhere in the range of 80 additional parking spaces. And uh, as you will hear as we get into some of this stuff later, um, Bates Mill is now, there's about 100,000 square feet of space in Bates Mill that's now under renovation to make room for expansion of um, grand rounds. And that space uh, therefore kicks in a requirement in the agreement between us and the developer for the city to provide parking for the renovated space. And we'll get into that in much more detail at some point in the not too distant future. Bates Mill 5, the environmental cleanup, that's designed for two purposes. One, to match an EPA grant that we have to start doing some remediation, environmental remedi remediation in Bates Mill 5. And even with that grant uh, to do a complete job, there's some additional funding required over and above the grant amount and the match amount. So it's two of those things, and that's a couple of year project. It is, of course, somewhat tied in and related to uh, when and whether uh, the developer goes forward with the complete renovations of Mill 5 and to ex exercise his option on Mill 5. And then, of course, we have the Lincoln Street parking garage uh, phase two. The amount scheduled for this year is basically the engineering design fee so that we can start uh, getting to the point where we could actually construct the garage. As a footnote, that garage is going to cost uh, more than the amount the city council is allowed to authorize in bonding without going to referendum. So unless uh, pricing changes or the project changes or some other agreements with the developer changes for that project to go forward as potential that we will have to have a referendum. And again, as noted, we'll be back to that parking issue going forward because there are some interesting comp complications in our agreement with the developer for the Bates Mill complex that uh, everybody needs to be aware of. There are some severe penalties that the city faces if we don't meet our obligations to the developer. The MIS department is uh, one of the things we started working on a few years ago was putting together a technology plan going forward to get a little bit better handle on where we were in terms of both software and hardware in the, in the city and, inter and communication systems. Our folks in MIS have done that and they have a multi-year project to try to address some of this <laughs> stuff. The big item in next year is a $250,000 replacement of our property tax system which is very old and antiquated uh, and clearly is an important key system given that that's where our majority of our revenue comes from. So replacing that system has about a quarter million dollar cost. One of the other projects, and this is a multi-year project that you'll see in, as you look at the detail, is replacing uh, or installing dark fiber, 
or fiber that would eventually be interconnecting all of our facilities. That's designed to do a couple things, one of which is to replace uh, what is becoming very expensive and old fiber that's leased, that the city leases from a private company. We used to have a great deal on that fiber because it was part of a uh, uh, deal with um, what's now First Light uh, that was then Oxford. They were in the cable television business for a while. And as a cable operator, they had to have a franchise agreement with us as part of that franchise agreement and as part of the agreement that they reached with us to end that franchise agreement when they got out of the business, they were required to provide us with very inexpensive fiber connections to various buildings and facilities for our, our networking purposes. Uh, that agreement is now timed out, and so we're also seeing the cost go up dramatically for the fiber installations that we do have, so we want to get away from that into something that is owned and controlled directly by the city. Police Department, I've mentioned a couple of times. Um, we do have funding this year to do an initial assessment of the building, to take a look at its internal systems. That building is now reaching the point where a lot of those systems are going to require replacements and upgrades because they no longer meet uh, standards. There's also space issues associated with the Police Department at the current time that, are, that we want to take a look at. So the money here will either go toward dealing with some of those uh, existing structural and core system issues at the department, or at least looking toward beginning an expansion if that's the direction we en eventually end up going. That clearly is gonna depend on what comes out of the study that uh, will be done this year. So we'll see how that progresses as we get that information back. Fire department wants to uh, refurbish ladder one. Ladder one is our large ladder truck uh, it is getting on toward 12 or 13 years old. One of the things that we have found is if you put in a significant amount of money to rehab these units, you can add to their effective life, maybe as much by f as, as by five years. Um, replacing that ladder truck will be in excess of a million dollars. Uh, so the longer we can put off having to do that while we retain a piece of equipment that's fully functional, the better. As you know, we just bought a Quint, uh, which has, has a ladder on it. That cost us almost a million dollars, and the ladder replacement will cost us over a million dollars. And if you know anything about fire equipment, which I know some of you sitting up there do, the escalation factor on fire equipment is far in excess of the rate of inflation in the economy as a whole. Uh, they're very custom design. They're very uh, labor-intensive units, so they are very expensive. Then the Main Street Fire Station replacement project, that funding would be for land acquisition to replace the Main Street Station. Public Works is looking for us a few things on buildings. One of the projects that we've been looking at is security upgrades for city facilities. Um, all of our buildings pretty much operate on a key system. For years, that key system was a proprietary system that uh, you could not necessarily duplicate the keys. That has expired, so now they can, people can duplicate the keys, and next thing we, we know, everybody in the world could have a key to get into the building. I will also tell you that we probably haven't been very good at tracking and monitoring and controlling the key entries into this building. We would like to switch over to an electronic system uh, that would allow us to have better security on the buildings, better control over who has access to the buildings, and records as to who goes in and out of the buildings when. So the first phase of that project is um, the entrance security upgrades, which would allow us to get the core system that would allow this to happen and begin working in phasing it in building by building. The Canal Street parking garage, that's a continuation of some renovations there. That is one of our older parking garages. It has a lot of deferred maintenance issues associated with it, so we need to continue to try to maintain that so that we don't run into even worse problems in the future. On the highway side, um, we started this year doing some work on the Birch Street, Karen, and Jefferson Street sidewalks. Those are sidewalks up around Longley School and the Colisee. 
Uh, this is a three-year project to try to improve all of the sidewalks up there. As uh, you will see later on here when we talk about sidewalk maintenance and rehabilitation, the cost of doing sidewalk work is roughly $110 per linear foot, which is a stunning amount of money when you think about it. And the problem with sidewalks is they are very labor intensive. You can't get those big paving machines on a sidewalk. So they are very costly in comparison, say, with the standard street paving project. So anyway, that's part of the project is to try to do those improvements up in that area for a couple of reasons. One is access to the high school, uh, and a second is to provide better access as well as, as to the um, Jude uh, Marcotte Park playground area. So that's two separate projects, one for those particular areas and streets and one general for street rehabilit for sidewalk rehabilitation. And again, there's a, a lot of these projects, there is a detailed breakdown in the book that shows you which projects, which sidewalks we're looking at in which year. Same thing you'll see for streets, although Dale's gonna be up here in a minute talking about where he wants to take our street paving program. And the same thing with water line replacement, things like that. There are breakdowns that show exactly where those projects are planned. Not to say they may not change from time to time. Street crosswalk uh, implementation. The city had a um, major arterial pedestrian crossing crosswalk study done by a consulting firm about a year ago that was completed that produced a plan showing us that we needed to spend somewhere around $1.1 million on our arterial streets improving existing crosswalks. Some of that's fairly simple, putting in correct signage but some of it gets more expensive if you look at um, the rapid blinking uh, warning signs and things like that that we started to go, go to. So this $75,000 would just be enough to get started on that project and it's something we'd like to continue over time. Some of that work will be done as part of other projects, particularly when we have a federal or state project. Uh, on an arterial, we can work in a lot of these uh, crosswalk improvements there. So we do not necessarily have to pay for all of it ourselves, but some of it we will have to come up with in terms of funding because it exceeds what the state or the feds are willing to pay for or because those projects are so far off in the future. Street maintenance program, $3.8 million. That is the largest single item on the general fund side of the budget. Um, that is significantly more than what we have been paying. Uh, this year, the last time we had, we have a periodic street condition study done by a consulting firm that then recommends how much money we should spend to maintain the existing level of quality of our streets. For the last three years, that amount has been in roughly $2.8 million. It's now estimated at $3.8 million, largely because we are now anticipating a 30% cost increase in paving contracts. Uh, you may have heard today that the state issued its three-year paving plan and is running into basically the same problem where they're going to be spending considerably more money and doing considerably less work because the costs of those projects have gone up so dramatically because contractors are having a hard time finding people to do the work. So that's what we're anticipating. We got away easy this last year because when we bid our paving this last year, it went out right after the state had, con had, had canceled a major contract uh, in the Portland area. And the contractor who was gonna do that project all of a sudden had this hole in his schedule and basically bid very similar to what we had the year before. But we are anticipating that this year we're gonna see that kind of significant increase. So that's gonna be painful because it's going to mean either we have to find more money to do the same amount of work or we'll have to find ways to or cut back on the amount of work that we want to do. East Avenue we'll be talking about later on tonight uh, on that project, so you'll hear more about that later. Municipal Garage, this is via our annual vehicle replacement program for $1.2 million. There is a complete, complete listing included in the big book 
uh, for the anticipated uh, replacement items this year and in future years. And I know that it's fairly normal for us to go over that in, a little, in quite a bit of detail as we get into the actual budget process and the um, borrowing process. Public Works open space, uh, two projects there. One is uh, installation of some soccer fields at the prior Hudson bus site. That's the site right across from Public Works where Adams Avenue runs into Bartlett Street. You may have noticed that it's now a big field with a big pile of uh, material on it. The plan is for that to become uh, several soccer fields with some associated parking. That is one of a number of projects associated with the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is a federal program which funds open space. When we built the new school on Franklin Pasture, that school was built on property that had a requirement to, re to be retained forever as open space. In order to get the school built, we had to commit to replacing that, over, that, that's, that open space with other open space of equal or greater value. So this is one of the projects associated with that. Another one is the school department purchasing Druin Field next to the Colisee from the uh, diocese. There are other projects that are coming up that fall into this same category too, but they're not going to be on the, in the next year. They will be in future years going forward. That's to replace con some other property that uh, was under that same restriction and, and at some point was taken out of open space for other uses. Dufresne Plaza, that's just simply trying to improve the surface over there. Surface is rough, it's got a lot of bricks in it. Bricks tend to heave and be uh, differentially heaved. So we have some tripping problems and we have a lot of problems over there in the winter time with ice and water uh, forming on that surface over there creating it, uh, hazardous conditions. School department, the McMahon, I, I'll let, I, can, I think I can let uh, Council, Council President LaJoy talk about the parking problems at uh, McMahon School. He's the expert on this. He's been working with school department and public works for some time about the traffic congestion that occurs around that school because of inadequate uh, parking, especially when people are dropping off and picking up students. And then Dingley Building Security is another project. They have the same kinds of problems at the school department that we have in our buildings and that they don't have a good uh, quality security system on that building. Um, in fact, as I, those of you who've visited that building know, there's no, really no security at all at the front door. Uh, unlike City Hall, where most of our offices have some level of security, people who walk into the Ding Dingley building, there's nothing that keeps them from going anywhere in that building. So they would like to address that. They would also like to upgrade all of their cameras. Right now, the school department has about 176 cameras that they need to upgrade and replace because they're beyond, actually many of them are beyond their expected life expectancy. They would also like to add cameras, uh, about 10, they're estimating about 10 additional cameras at each of 10 schools to improve their coverage. Next up is the sewer division. A lot of the work that's going on in our utilities is continuing ongoing work, just dealing with aged infrastructure. So in the sewer division, the biggest single project is rehabilitation of old sanitary sewer mains. Um, as, as you know, this is a community that's been around for a long time. Our sewer system has been around for a long time and a lot of our sewer system is old and needs to be replaced. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is simply because we don't want that system to fail uh, and to create problems and to back up into people's properties. Another is that a lot of those old systems are subject to inflow and in infiltration where um, Rainwater, surface water can drain into our sewer system. That limits the capacity of the sewer system for other uh, water and rainstorms and stuff like that. Also adds to our cost because that all ends up going through treatment at the treatment plant and it requires in many instances pumping and other kinds of, of expense. So there's some good reasons to try to continue to upgrade our sewer system. Equipment replacement in sewer is just one three-quarter ton pickup truck. 
uh, collection system inspection and rehabilitation. That's part of an overall project where we're trying to have all of our sewer lines inspected so that we can determine where the problems are and where we need to best spend our funds to try to deal with them. Combined sewer overflow separation projects and storage. Combined sewer overflows traditionally in old communities, um, you didn't have a separate storm drain system. You had a single system that handled both your sanitary uh, sewer system and stormwater. Those systems were normally designed to carry four times the dry weather flow, um, which is not sufficient when you have a significant rainstorm event. So those systems were also then designed when they reached or exceeded capacity to overflow into other water bodies, particularly rivers and streams. We have a large number of uh, CSO overflows in this community. We're under uh, effectively a, a consent order or an agreement with EPA and DP, DEP to address our CSO issues. We have been doing so for over 15 years. Uh, many of those years, the annual expenditures have been in the one and a half to two million dollar range to try to address CSOs. That's a continuation of that project. And then the big part, the next big issue, is the CSO storage at Lopka I mentioned earlier, which is a very large storage tank. So in wet weather, when there's ex excess capacity, instead of overflowing into the river, the overflow goes into the storage tank and is, is retained there until the rainstorm passes and the level of the system drops, at which point it then goes back into the system and into the treatment plant as opposed to the river. That amount there for the $250,000 is a very small down payment on a very large project. Um, pump station replacement, we have about 15 pump stations. Generally speaking, you like to design your sewer system so it's gravity flow, so that everything flows downhill. Unfortunately, our topography does not always cooperate in that regard. We have these nasty things called hills that get in the way. And when you have that, you have to pump. Uh, effectively, you have to have a lift station that pumps the material up high enough again to once again feed it into a gravity flow system. Some of our stations are old. We're in the process of uh, replacing them before they fail. You don't want those to fail again for the same reasons. They can back up into people's homes and overflow into the environment. And that last item, criticality and, cri criticality and risk assessment of the collection system, that's also a requirement of the f federal and state regulators. It helps us identify and prioritize our future projects to make sure we're dealing with those that, that might create the biggest problem in the environment should a part of our system fail. On the stormwater division, some of this is very similar. Uh, we have an ongoing program of storm drain inspection. We're now in the, this would be the third year of a five-year program, again, trying to identify problems in our system that need to be addressed and corrected in the future. We include on an annual basis some funding for storm drain drainage work that has to be done as part of our street paving programs. In some instances, that might be something like installing under drain. In other instances, it might actually be replacing a, a part of a drainage pipe if it's old and failing. The Jepson Brook project is a multi-year project to deal with a capacity issue in Jepson Brook. Jepson Brook drains uh, from the bog over behind what used to be Hannaford, uh, the Garcelon bog, all the way over to the river. A good chunk of that drainage channel is actually a concrete line channel. Uh, it has restricted capacity at certain places, where, primarily where it goes under streets. The capacity is restricted to the extent that we, we need to expand it to ensure that we don't have flooding problems along that stream. This again, we've started doing some things in the last few years. We've replaced some areas where the concrete has failed. We've cleaned the drainage channel to ensure that obstructions are out of the way. Now we're gonna to have to start addressing and, uh, and tackling the street crossings where um, the channels under the streets don't have the same capacity as the larger channel does and creates back a, a, a bottleneck and backlog. And again, the sewer separation and CSO programs that we've talked about. 
On the water side, uh, we're going to continue to upgrade our SCADA system. I actually looked this up today because I've talked about a SCADA system for many years, and I said, well, what does that all mean anyway? A SCADA, SCADA system is a supervisory control and data acquisition system. So now that's clear, clear as mud, right? Basically, it's a system that allows us to monitor and control our water system uh, at a central location. So for example, we have a number of water storage tanks in the system, and it can tell us in, in, at one location how much, is, how much water is in, is in those tanks. It can allow us to remotely uh, fill them, uh, to actually monitor the pumping that's coming in from the pump stations, and keep a good handle on where our system stands uh, today. And again, it can be used in a number of other ways, but that's the basic idea. So continuing to work and upgrade that system. This project in particular has to do with our storage tanks up at Weber, Weber Avenue and out on Ferry Road. Distribution water main replacement and rehabilitation. We have an awful lot of old unlined cast iron sewer uh, uh, water lines. And I'll ask Kevin or Dale to bring in at some meeting an example of one of these old pipes. And what you can end up with is a water pipe that might be four inches wide, of a four inch diameter. And because of the corrosion that's built up in the system over time, you have this much actual room for water to flow through it. So we have gone away from those, that cast iron to something that's, that's got some protection inside. Still, it's still cast iron, but it's protected to reduce that kind of inf inflow and infiltration or, or of corrosion. Again, it can restrict your flow, it can restrict water pressure, it can restrict fire flows to hydrants and other things like this. So we're trying to eventually replace all of that old pipe. Equipment replacement, again, a relatively small item there. It's uh, one unit that needs to be replaced. Lake Auburn watershed, on an annual basis, we appropriate money to the Watershed Protection Commission's sinking fund. Those are funds that the commission can use for a variety of purposes, one of which they, they have used it for most often, is land acquisition immediately surrounding the lake for purposes of controlling uh, inflow into the, into the water body and trying to ensure that we retain our filtration waiver uh, for Lake Auburn water. And then the meter program, there are two things going on there. We are gradually switching over to radio-based uh, water meters which can be remotely read, so that's one part of that program. And under PUC rules, we're pretty much required to replace all water meters in a 10-year cycle. So there's also a continuing recycle here of replacing meters that goes on every year. Now the fund number, the death, debt authorization limit for next year. This is kind of where we go da 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 and pull, pull back the curtain. Um, this is a hard chart to read up there, but basically what it does is it tries to, to look at the last three years of what we've actually paid in principle, <coughs> average that amount, uh, make some, some adjustments to it, and then apply the 80% factor to it. Our local debt limitation number for next year is 7275000 and some change. The requests are at $10.9 million, so we're $3.6 million over the limit. Um, I will note that, as I mentioned earlier, almost universally the uh, number requested will come down. In some years, that reduction has been in the 20 to 40 percent range. So I know that that number will come down. I can't, I can't guarantee you how far it will come down, but certainly we'll make some adjustments there as we go on. The debt limit is a very problematic number when we have large projects. Uh, if you have a $7.3 million debt limit and you have a $5.7 million fire station project, there's not much room left for almost anything else. And even this year where we don't have a fire station project, if you look at that limit and you apply $3 million in paving and $1.2 million in vehicle, replacement, that leaves $3 million for all other needs. So it's getting very difficult to operate within that debt limit if there's a large project that's in, an, in a year. And there are more large projects coming up now because for so long we didn't do any. 
You know, the fire stations that we're replacing now could easily have been replaced 10, 15, 20 years ago, given their age and condition. Unfortunately, they weren't for whatever reasons. Certainly during the, the recession, it was not possible. So now a lot of that is catching up with us. There again, it just shows you the summary numbers that were $3.6 million over the limit as proposed. Uh, again, with an anticipation that that will come down. And then in conclusion, where this goes from here, uh, on February 4th, City Council will have a first public hearing on um, the capital improvement plan to get feedback from the public. On February 12th, uh, we'll be looking for the Finance Committee and the Planning Board to make a recommendation. Heather and I will be coming to what we anticipate will be a joint meeting of the two group of the Finance Committee and the Planning Board on the 27th. on the 27th uh, to go over this and answer any questions that folks may have. We would ask that if you have questions going through the book or on anything that came up tonight, send an email to uh, Heather or I uh, or Dave Hediger if you're on the Planning Board so that we can be prepared to try to answer that question at that meeting. I know you folks are under the gun here to come up with a pretty quick recommendation for the city council and there's an awful lot of material here. So if you have questions, let us know. We'll be glad to answer. Uh, those recommendations go to the council. Then the council is scheduled to adopt the LCIP on the 18th um, of February. Uh, the charter requires that it be done by March 1st. There's a little bit of flexibility there. I will point out, because this comes up often, uh, it's been my experience that the council does take into account very carefully the recommendations of the Finance Committee and the Planning Board as they finalize this project. That often happens later in the process than the actual adoption of the plan. So they may adopt a plan and not take everything you said into account, but when they actually get down to determining what gets funded and what doesn't, that's often where we see the council looking very carefully at the recommendations from the two boards and making some of the, some or in some instances pretty much all of the adjustments that are recommended. Although it's obviously up to final choice of the council. So that's the overall plan. I've probably talked longer than I should have. <laughs> uh, but I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have tonight or certainly at any point throughout this process. All right, thank you, uh, Administrator Barrett. Any questions, comments? Councilor Ray. Thank you. Um, so just a couple things from the earliest uh, slides on here. Um, on page two, I guess it's slide four. Um, are we to understand that the school has not submitted proposed bond issues for 2024 and 2025? That's correct, and I suspect that's largely because of the new school superintendent wanting to spend some more time uh, and get a better handle on what the needs are going forward. I know that he's in the process of evaluating a lot of what's been going on in the school department, so I suspect he'll be making some adjustments later in future years. They're also planning a facility study, so that will dictate in those out years what kind of projects and funding that they'll need. Yes. Okay, on slide six, um, are we to understand that there's debt service only on the city pension and school portions of the outstanding debt? I think, what? The, the pension obligation debt? Yeah. That's city only. So our service on these is being paid we, we, we have outstanding about $1.3 million in pension obligation debt. Um, That's what it says here, yeah. Yeah, between the two fiscal years, I think it's closer to 2.6-ish. Yeah, so okay. we, owe, we still owe about 2.6, okay. and we're, pay, we're paying it off over this year, over the next two years. Okay. And the then, schools are different because for so many years that was all um, paid for by the state. So the state's carrying that uh, on, on that, that obligation, not the municipality. Okay, and then last one uh, on slide eight. Um, fiscal year 2005 and 2015 have asterisks on them and I don't know, there's no note. So I don't know if there's something I think that was because of the state funding. Slide six. Eight. 
We use the asterisk on uh, 2005 because that's what we considered to be our peak debt year. And 2015, I believe, was the middle school expansion. So that's the, the first, let me check here. Or was that the year we paid off the Colisee debt? Yes, it, it's one of those two. So I can verify that. Thank you. Ms. Cox. Um, <clears throat> I'm carefully holding all of my questions to the appropriate parts in the process. Um, but I think the one question about the process that I'd like to ask is, I appreciate that the um, city council will take our recommendation to heart and that it might be more through the budgeting process than just the adoption for the deadline. Does that mean we have a chance to alter or create more detail for our recommendations after March 1st? or? Is it heard after March 1st, but we better nail it before March 1st? Well, you're required by the charter to make the recommendation by uh, the middle of, effectively the middle of February. So you have to make a recommendation then, but there's certainly not, nothing that says you couldn't add to that or adjust that later in the process, uh, at least up until the point, obviously, where the council makes its final funding decisions as a part of the budget process. Does the council have a preference on how that happens given the timeline uh, you know it's a long process through the budget so I think the earlier the better if that answers you know if that helps but that's just uh, my position on that <coughs> but there is a charter requirement that you make a recommendation by the middle effectively the middle of February may I ask another process question sure um, and I'd, I'd look to the chair of our planning board um, I'm looking at this timeline and noting that our next scheduled meeting is another joint meeting with the Finance Committee and so at what point do we have a working session to create our recommendation or is that what we're doing here today and with the Finance Committee on the 27th <laughs> <laughs> Dave you can't look behind you <laughs> I guess just the time, I mean, I get consuming information and making sense of it and asking clarifications, but there seems to be some work group activities to form a cohesive and shared recommendation to guide this council. Yep, so we're, we're um, literally doing things a little different as of today. I'm um, having this joint workshop with the finance committee next, or our next meeting on the 27th. And that's in part to, um, for both groups to have the benefit of Heather and Ed at that meeting, because traditionally it's been to the planning board and the finance committee hasn't had that luxury of getting the details from these two folks um, after that workshop then you folks will be having your official public hearing that you're supposed to have on the 27th my guess is you may not have all of your decisions made at that point so we still have another meeting on February 10th for us to wrap things up and get a formal recommendation to the council two days later two yeah, days two, two weeks yes no, we, we meet february 10th and then on the 12th we have to give the formal recommendation well yes so ideally so that days. so literally on the on the 10th you folks will be providing us the recommendation doug and i will get that in writing to administration and the council so you Thank have you. basically two opportunities to finalize this document your request so bring dinner that night yeah, those sound like some marathon sessions. Join us. Any other uh, questions or comments? Councilor Pettengill? Uh, just to uh, um, Ms. Cox, as a former planning board member, um, in years past, the planning board has done a fantastic job with being able to digest this information and present a, a normally well thought out um, recommendation to it. It seems like a lot in there, um, and I have full confidence with you know the members on here, some of whom I'd served with back on the planning board, um, to continue to do that that job. I, I think you guys do a fantastic job at getting that recommendation to us, and it, it it's a lot in there, but you'll you'll do you'll do a good job. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. If I could, um, just a reminder. That's why it's important if you have questions as you're reading through the document to send them as soon as you have them and then that way by the time we whether it's the 27th or even later um, we can have that information have those answers ready for you instead of waiting till the meeting and trying to scramble to get the answers back to you 
Do you want us to copy our fellow planning board members on those questions so you don't get duplicates? Yeah. Um, that would yeah. be helpful, yes. Okay. okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you. Uh, so the rest of the agenda, is that still between planning board and council? Nope. They, they, they can be dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pauline. We didn't even spill water on the server. No, we didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not there yet. I think it's, I think it's, it's a bit different. Yeah. I might get a dinner with people I care about. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I've been eating cold eggs like that. All right, sorry. Okay. Does anybody need a uh, five minutes or anything? Councilors? Anyone need five minutes right now? Do you want us to do your... Thank you. If you wouldn't mind, please. one place, I'll go back. Okay, let's bring it back to order. Uh, we're going to move to agenda item number two, overview of the city pavement program. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Tonight I would, um, I'd like to go through a little bit. Pavement's going to be something we'll, over the next year or so, I suspect I'll take a ride with most of you out to see a constituent and we'll want to talk about. It's just one of those things like snow plowing that comes up a lot. It's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. Um, one of the things I was asked to do when I came here um, and we're partway through it is really look at the paving program, see if we could uh, maybe rationalize it a little bit more. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about the paving program and pavements in the cities, um, the city, give a little bit of background, um, talk a little bit about our network and what it's like today, um, what our responsibilities are, um, talk about kind of our past and current pavement approach and then maybe talk about a simple, a little more simplified uh, pavement approach. Um, we're going to end up, you saw in the last presentation, um, kind of the investment in paving that, um, that's proposed. I'm going to talk a little bit around um, a proposal that came from a consultant that's similar to what Ed described before. But then I'm going to come around to a rational approach. I'm going to come back to something very similar to that number, but maybe with a better outcome. So that's, that's what we're going to run through today. So um, for background, um, Goro Palmer had done a pavement assessment for us um, back in um, 2015 and 2016. Um, every few years, we want them to redo it, and we'll talk about why in a few moments. So this summer, they did another one. Um, they took, went through the city, took over 2,000 um, measurements of street segments to understand what our streets, what condition our streets in, and how our streets are tending, how are trending, and how they're degrading. Um, and how we should respond to that. Um, the city is, um, is made up of a, a couple different street networks, and we're going to go to a map in just a moment, but I'll start by talking about them a little bit. There's um, 189 miles of um, public road in the city, if you exclude the turnpike and um, state bridges. So remember, 189 miles we have some responsibility for. Of that 189 miles, 133 of those miles are solely the response of the responsibility of the city. Those are our local streets. 38 miles are major collectors. Um, they're state and state aid highways that the state's probably never going to get to, um, really doesn't intend to, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So we have some shared responsibility there. There's some programs um, that, we can, um, that we can use to address those. And then there are 18 miles of, of um, arterial highways throughout the city. And those are really the responsibility of the state. And our job there is to really advocate for them that the state manage those in a way that's, um, 
that's responsible. Sometimes those arterials, or oftentimes those arterials, are going to be, um, um, our responsibility is going to be 10% match, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk a lot about that when we get to the LCIB and the final and the budget talks. If you, if you'd, um, I think, should be at your at your seats. There should be a map, something like this. You can just pull that out for a moment. We just talked about our network and that 133 miles. If you look at all the little black squiggly lines on there, those are our local streets. Those are the ones that there are 133 miles that we are solely responsible for. Those belong to the city. Those are managed by the city. If you look on that chart and then you go to the, um, the blue, that's those major, um, major collectors we talked about that probably is going to be something the city's going to have to address along partnering with the state um, with some 50-50 programs and a third, third, third programs, and, and we'll talk about those when we get deeper in. So those are kind of the shared responsibility, the blue lines. The um, purple lines, the dark black line, and the, and the uh, green line, that's the part that really should be pre predominantly the state's responsibility at times with a 10% match from us, okay? So when you, you know, at, as, you, as you're going along and you get a question about a road, at least this at least helps to let you know what kind of program it is. I think during the orientation we chatted a little bit about that, and we'll chat some more in a moment. If it'll bring us to the next slide, the way we assess our city streets, and like I said, there was over 2,000 um, street segments analyzed this summer. Um, and then what, what happens the, is they look at um, cracking, they look at surface degradation, they look at rutting, they look at um, the overall street profile, is it shedding the water the, uh, water the way it should, um, and other types of degradation of our streets. Put those into an algorithm and those pop out um, some rating. And that rating is really from zero to 100. You can kind of see it in the color, color slide there. Starts out with failed and ends up with good, or ends up, starts with good and ends up with failed, probably is probably more accurate. And just to give you some samples of what those might look like. Um, so one of the things I'd like you to remember is 55 or 56, the division between 55 and 56. We're gonna come back to that a couple times today. So those photographs that are on, the, on, the, on this slide are really those street segments that are 55 and above. So they're in pretty good condition, right? So good, that's a brand new street just paved. There's no, you can see no degradation, you can see no distress. If you go to satisfactory, you'll see some longitudinal cracks, those are cracks that run down the street. Kind of when it, as it degrades to fair, you'll see some longitudinal cracks, you'll start to see transverse cracks that are going the other way. And that's really frost action and just wear and tear on the street. You'll notice when you get down to fair, you're starting to see more of the stone so some of the asphalt's wearing away and exposing the stone, that's when rutting will start. If that'll bring us to the next slide. If you skip down below 55, it's poor, serious, and failed, and I didn't put very poor in just for expediency, but you know, you're starting to see more longitudinal cracks, um, crack, transverse cracks going across, cracks interconnecting with other cracks. You're seeing more of the aggregate exposed. You know, that street's really getting along in its life. At Sirius, you're seeing something called alligator cracking. I think you've all seen it. You see why it's called alligator cracking. It's just, it looks like the back of an alligator. And at that point, the entire pavement structure has failed. You know, the pavement structure is not only the pavement, but it's the base material beneath. That road is moving so much, or heaving with frost and then being driven down by traffic, that it's just like when you walk out on a sheet of ice and you step. You know, it turns into that kind of a crack. You know, that's what it looks like when you're about to get wet. And then uh, failed, you can see large sections of the pavement have been cut out and replaced. All of those slides, water is getting through the pavement surface and into the base. In Maine, that's freezing and heaving, and then in the spring when it melts, it's being driven back down by traffic. So when, you're at, when you begin, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, when you're getting into these segments, that pavement's degrading quite quickly. It's, it's gonna progress from, from 55 to 26 to 11 to, you know, to, to 10 or less very quickly. So kind of where are we today? Um, when we measured our system back in uh, 2015, we had an overall, overall PCI rating of 72. Um, we currently have a PCI rating, or a rating at least the summer, of 74. That's good, that went up. The bad news is that's mostly state roads that's, that, 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 that accounts for that increase. 
you look at the chart in front of you, that's the state highways. And if you look at satisfactory and good, both of those columns grew. So the states, through our advocacy and our support, the state's doing a pretty good job on state roads. If it'll bring us to the next chart, that's the local roads. That's those black little lines. And you'll notice a couple things. One, we've brought good, um, satisfactory to good in a lot of cases. And we'll talk about that in a moment um, when we talk about the two approaches. Um, but if you look down to very poor, headed towards serious, you know, there's an increase down there. I want you to, th I want you to remember that because we're going to come to a slide that's going to look very much like this in a moment. The approach that we currently take and that, that um, most entities take is a mixture between condition rating for selection of projects and pavement preservation. And in a moment, we're going to come back to the slide in a second, but I'm going to show you kind of what that looks like. And then we're going to come back to this one and then we'll look into the future and we'll see something very similar using that approach and why maybe we ought to take a little different approach in the city of Lewiston given the conditions that we have. If that'll bring us to the next one. If you think of your house, if you paint your house today and a year from now you go look at the, your painted house, you know, paint lasts about five to seven years to clean a house, at least mine seems to be four, but you know, five to seven years I'm always painting my house. Now I have finally have a vinyl sided house. but. You know, you paint your house, a couple of years, it looks pretty good. So if you follow that green line from the left to the right, the right being time, kind of think those, those ticks as years, you know, for a couple of years, that pavement holds up pretty well. Water's not, there's not a lot of the cracks. Remember that first slide with the pictures? Um, not a lot of water getting through the pavement. There's not a lot of oxidation, oxidation of the asphalt. It's not exposing the aggregate to be winnowed away through, through traffic. Um, there's not a lot of cycles of frost, freeze, thaw, and driving, so that it's just, it's holding up for a few years. You know, the asphalt's still very pliable and kind of moves well. But as you go out, that green line starts to tip off and, and, and decline more rapidly. Same thing if you paint your house. You know, in year three, you had a few chips. Year four, you got quite a few. Year five, you're starting to see some wood, right? And year six or seven, you're painting it. And that's, that's kind of that, that shape that goes from the green and then into the dashed red. Once your house is all wood, it kind of starts to flatten out again, right? Because there's, there's more wood than there is paint. So same thing on pavement. Once you get to a certain point, it flattens back out. So looking at that chart, there are, two, there are kind of two approaches to pavement management. One is let the green, let the, let the pavement slide all the way down through the green and then down through the red and then fix it and bring it all the way back to the top again. And when you fix it there, it's very expensive because you're rebuilding the road. Um, there are some other alternatives we'll talk about in a moment. The other alternative is go down in the green and when you start to get to that steep part of the curve, you know, painting your house year three, right? You want to grab that and pull that back up to the top. It doesn't, that chart's kind of misleading and they all are. They're all kind of a little over optimistic. You don't, it all doesn't always come all, there's a hysteresis. It doesn't come all the way back. You can only do it so many times before your curb reveal's gone and drainage doesn't work, but, but that's kind of the strategy. Start to slide off when you get to the steep portion of the curve, pull it back quick, and then head back down and you know, continue that. That's a must, each of those actions are much less expensive. Let's, if Ed would pull back one slide, just for a moment. Take a look at this graph. If you kind of think about it, see the two circles I've drawn on here, the right hand circle, yep, the right hand circle. If you're taking a pavement, pavement management approach and you're doing pavement preservation, mightn't something look like that, right? You're starting to get pavements that are going from satisfactory to fair. Oh my God, I'm getting to the steep part of the curve on that road. Let's pull that road back, right? The problem with that approach is if it's underfunded, and we'll see it in, the, in a future projection in a few moments, is that when roads get to the point where they're falling down on that curve, and if you don't fund that well enough, one of the problems when you start one of these programs is a lot of pavements have gone past that. They're already past it, and they're very expensive to replace. So you can put a fair amount of investment. If you started out with a brand new city, pavement management is the way to go. If you start out with big pocketbook, pavement management and pavement pres pre preservation is the way to go. The trouble is if you're not willing to put enough money in to pull those bad roads back up into that system, then you're gonna get what you see on the left-hand circle where that very poor is starting to, starting to grow. And you'll see that. We're gonna project out 10 years in a few moments and you're gonna see that more. I think for us there might be another alternative to um, pavement preservation on the lower class roads. And that's, that's kind of where I'm headed here. If it'll go ahead two now, it'd be great. 
If you look at that, so a couple of things, um, under investment and pavement, a couple of years ago, quite a few years ago now, probably 12 or 14 years ago, I'm getting older, um, because when the recession started, um, DOT was unable to invest in, in a couple of their payment programs. One of them was their LCIP program, I mean their um, LCP program. Too many acronyms too close together. Um, and for two years, they underfunded it to about the tune of half to two thirds. Once they did that, it took over a decade, almost a decade to get back. Because even though they had to overfund to get back, it took almost a decade to pull the system back. So this chart up here is showing you what would happen if we decided to forego funding of a pavement management, our, our street maintenance program for the next 10 years. Now, no, we're not going to do that, of course. But it just illustrates um, a little bit of how quickly it goes. And remember that curve. If that's the average, if that big yellow line at poor is there at 10 years, where is it 11? It's probably at very poor, serious, and sliding into failed, right? Because now you're on the steep side of the slope. We're not going to, I can't imagine the city not funding it. But, but just, this just illustrates what happens if you underfund a program like this. And you shouldn't overfund it, but you shouldn't underfund it. And there's a sweet spot. We're going we're gonna to hone in on that in a few moments. If that'll bring us to the next slide, um, what, what, part of what the consultant does or did um, this year, we'll, we'll see if that's what we continue in the future, is they collect the data. They put it into something called um, PAVER, which Army Corps engineers and some others developed for a couple of things. And it looks at <clears throat> all of the best treatments you can do, where well, you get the biggest bang for your buck, and it tells you, you can tell it different amounts of money. Unfortunately, it's money, not mileage, and we're going to circle around to that in a minute. And it tells you, you know, what the system will look like in five or ten years. And it will pick treatments, which are a little bit black boxy, and you can't really figure out, or I can't really figure out, um, how it does that. But, but let's just take it, for, take it at face value right now. Out ten years, if a, um, APWA paver is going to tell us that's the, that's the network look, if we were to invest $3.1 million dollars which is about 7 or 8% above what we invested last year. And we're going to circle around to that as well. But about three point, a little bit more than we invested last year. What I really want you to pay attention to is kind of the right-hand side of the chart. It's great, right? Goods going up. We're getting the, we're getting the same um, 69, around 69. Right now our, our PCI value is for local roads is 69.9. That keeps us in the 69s. So if that's the goal, to, to have the same average pavement across the city, that's great. It's doing that. It's pulling some up to good. But look at that circle on the left, that one we talked about a few moments ago. Look what it's doing. It's not investing in those roads that are on that steep curve. And a lot of your constituents are going to see their, if we were to follow that to the letter, you know, they're going to see their pavements really decline fairly quickly. And it's a lot of roads that maybe, maybe are things we can find another avenue to take care of those. And we're going to chat about that in a moment. I believe in pavement preservation. Pavement preservation is definitely the way to go. If, if your road network is in a good place to start with and if you're willing to fund it. And that's not 3.1 million, as the consultant suggests here. That's probably 3.5 or 4 million. Because you've got to catch those expensive roads on the left if that's your strategy. So let's circle around and come up with another strategy. Let's take it then, let's go to the next slide if we would, Ed. So this just, I, I think I just summarized that. We'll skip on to the next one. So what if we took an approach, especially on um, small roads with, with less traffic? You know, those black roads, especially on the lower end, we really looked at the life cycle of those roads. How long would they live? And instead of asking pay for how much we spend, then figure out what to spend it on after, why don't we figure out, you know, you put, you put shingles on your roof, right? And they're 20 year shingles. You probably ought to be thinking about in year 18 or 22, putting shingles on your roof again, right? Because you know they're gonna last about 20 years. Put tires on your car, you got 50,000 mile tires. You gotta start thinking that probably in a few years you're gonna be putting another set of tires on. Pavement's no different. And we'll get to um, a graphic in a minute showing that. And, and this seems a little more complicated, but it's not intended to be. It's intended to simplify things a bit. So roads that are city streets, the black streets, that have less than 250 cars per day, think about those. Um, the um, um, most traffic engineers will tell you, and, and most national standards, that people do about 10 trips a day out of their homes. That's probably some of us don't. 
but some of us do. You know, my wife and I don't have kids anymore. We leave in the morning, we come back at night. That's, that's two trips down our road. Um, she does the same thing, so there's four trips. When we have kids in soccer, that's probably another two or three or four, the school bus. So that house generates anywhere between, um, you know, five and ten trips a day. So let's just assume it's ten trips. That's a road with 25 houses on it. So that's a cul-de-sac road. That's really the roads that aren't going anywhere. They're not connecting to anything. They're really delivering people from their home to some higher class road. There's 72 miles of those in the city, okay? So if we assume those, and, and typically they are lasting, and we'll, I'll show you that in a moment, or I think they're lasting between 20 and 30 years, typically, and maybe a little shorter in some places, a little longer in others. We really maybe ought to be focusing on 3.6 miles of that class of road a year. And the same thing goes for the next class up. You get up greater than 250 to um, a gra uh, less than or equal to 1,000. Now, now those cul-de-sac roads are coming together and, and traffic is coalescing. And we'll talk about some approaches to those in a second. And then greater than 1,000 are local roads that are really starting to act like those state collectors. Okay? So it's, you know, maybe that leads us to something that we'll circle around to in a second. Next chart, Ed, if you would. Remember that degradation curve I showed you at the beginning starts off flat and drops off quickly? This is ours right here. And we have a lot of work to do. That's a lot better than it was five years ago. There's a lot of extraneous, there's a lot of probably questionable data in there, but there's some good data in there. That left circle should be flatter than that. I don't know why it's not flat, but that's something I gotta figure out. Why why do we seem to be losing pavements quicker than we quicker than we are? And then them leveling out and continuing. I, I think there's something in the data we gotta we gotta figure out there. But if you go way over to the right, the same thing. Why isn't that dropping off more? And I think it's our pavement history isn't as good as it was. I think it's good for the last five or six years, 10 years, but, but beyond 10 years, you know, we weren't paying as much attention here. But I think that leads you back to, if you kind of look at that green line and you look at the lower red line, you can kind of pick that 10, 15, and 20 years out of there and think, especially that lower part of the graph, those are roads we really should be addressing in about that time. As that graph gets better, we'll be able to refine those numbers better, but it kind of leads you to there. One of the things we'll do next round is really break, it, break this chart into those segments so I can look at the cul-de-sac roads differently than I look at the greater than 10,000 roads because they're getting a lot of different traffic. But that's kind of where the, where the tongue-in-cheek life cycle comes from and will come from in the future. So let's just talk about some of the roads and some of the approaches. That less than 250 vehicles today, those cul-de-sacs, the short little residential roads, what's our objective there? I believe our objective is to provide a good ride, decent surface drainage, so we're not having either issues with water getting into the road surface and degrading it quicker than it should, or issues in people's yards and things. So it's really, for me, it's really ride. The ride is okay. You know, it's really slow speed. Um, not a lot of traffic, car-to-car -car conflict. So I think that's really our approach. From the previous slide, maybe we focus on about three and a half to four miles a year on average. Some years we might not do none, but some years we should do more. I think this is a place, because this has the 72 miles, has a fair amount of uh, mileage, you know, really focusing light treatments here. Maybe doing things like bundling these together um, and some of those um, um, treatment types. Might, this might be a place where we get some savings and really can stretch our money. Could we spend less than we're spending today to re keep rebuilding these roads to do some light overlays? And maybe those light overlays don't weigh, won't last 30 years, but maybe they last, or 20 years, maybe they last 15 years, but we can do three times as much. So th those are the kind of things we want to look over the next year. I do believe when we have roads, when we're underfunding, when we can't fund due to whatever reason in the city, these are the roads we should cut, not, not the higher class ones that we'll talk about. So 250 to 1,000, now you're getting multiple, multi, multiples of these um, smaller residential roads are starting to coalesce into larger roads. So maybe our objective's a little different. Maybe now we really should uh, maintain the ride still. We still should be working on maintaining drainage for all the reasons we talked about. But now maybe we ought to really be talking about making sure we have a good profile for snow fighting. We want snow, um, we want snow removal, we want that surface clean. Now you're starting to have more conflicts between traffic, so we want it to be safe. Um, again, both of these two, instead of a pavement preservation approach, maybe these are really based on condition. We're choosing them based on, on condition. There are some alleyways in both of these two classes, and there are some, um, or at least in the first class, and there are also some public easements 
that, that, that maybe we hold off on a little bit. We'll talk about those in the future sometime. Again, continue to bundle these. The biggest shock I've gotten between the cost of paving in the city and the cost of paving at DOT is these short little segments and what we pay in mobilization. Getting the paver there, getting the pavement there, getting traffic control set up, clearing yards um, causes, causes us to have multi, many times a higher expense overall. If we can bundle roads together, that means not every, every um, ward might not get the same amount every year. If we all agree that bundling these roads together gets us a better value, so overall, over a five-year period, we get more roads, that's a good thing. Right? Those are the kind of areas we want to focus in the future. Next one, um, greater than 1,000. These are acting like the collectors, I think, um, same sort of thing. Maybe some preservation sinks in here, but again, I think we should address them mostly the same way. Now, um, now you're getting enough vehicles, so we really ought to be looking at overall safety. On that lesson 250, if you go down the street and you go around a pothole, you know, there's 250 cars a day, there's probably no other car on the street at that moment, so you're probably in a good place. Once you're greater than 1,000, if you're two, three, four thousand, there may be a car in the other lane, there may be a pedestrian, or there may be a school bus. So now we really ought to be also thinking, in addition to all of the things we talked about before, um, safety, and we ought to also talk about mobility. We want goods and services to come in and out of the city, communities come in and out of the city well. Um, so those are the kind of things we should be focusing on. So maybe we grab these roads a little earlier. And we should be doing on average about 2.1 miles of these roads a year. The last two groups um, we talked about before, those collectors. Um, there's a 50-50 program called the MPI program at the state. As long as we get in a couple years and we plan a couple years ahead, um, we really should be trying to um, uh, exploit that to the, point, to the extent we can. It's 50-50 up to a half a million dollars per community per year. Um, it's first come, first serve. They usually open the gates in about January. Um, the last year we were pretty successful with several. Um, we're going to um, be very aggressive about those. Now, if we go and put in an application and that next year, a year and a half from now, the council chooses not to fund it, that's okay, but at least we're in the queue and, and in the doorway. Um, there's another program that's a third, a third, a third. If a business is coming here, expanding, or, um, or it, so the road is impeding their ability to um, realize their, their potential, um, that's another program we should be looking at. And it's a third us, a third the business, and a third the, um, and, and a third the state. You know, maybe an example of that is something that's in around the college or something. You know, we've been talking about a couple roads there. If we can't get in the 50-50 program, you know, the college being able to, um, to manage their business and if it's affecting them, there's another program. We can take swing at both, right? And then the arterials, you know, that, that's really, we're now we're getting down to things that really affect um, our economic vitality and we really should be advocating for both those and the collectors and really keeping those as the state has done in the, one of the first charts keeping those in good condition keeping those safe keeping mobility up there because that's really um, affects our overall um, vitality of the community just some other things to talk about Ed mentioned early stole my thunder a little bit um, most communities are seeing a 20 to 30 percent increase in paving this year as Ed said it's a little bit of materials, but it's a lot of labor. What worries me about labor is materials go up and down, right? As the economy gets better, cost of materials go up really quickly while supply and demand's low, but usually things catch up and, and things kind of settle out. I, I don't see the labor issue in the trades leveling out anytime soon. And as long as there's demand at public <coughs> works departments, the state, all of our contractors, we're all, we're all vying for a very small pool. I don't know um, that, um, that that's something, that's something that I think we're going to have to make that decision that Ed talked about earlier today. Um, second bullet up there, late, what we've done as of late, and I don't know how long this has gone on, if we have um, either sewer or water or stormwater projects or combined, sometimes it's all three, on a street, um, the, the replacement of the paving predominantly comes out of, out of this program. But sometimes the street's not in that bad a shape. Remember that 55? Greater than 55 is good. Um, that's not a road where we're probably going to pay for quite a while. So should that really come out of this program, or should that come out of the utilities? And I think probably it should come out of the utility and the utility payers instead of out of the general fund. That is a big shift. That's something we should definitely talk about over the next year if we're going to build that in. But uh, that'll stretch our paving dollars significantly. 
um, we talked about um, both alternate treatments and, um, and pooling projects. And I think that's where our greatest saving and greatest stretch might come from. Uh, the next slide is repeating a lot of the other stuff we've talked about today. Um, Ed also talked about the, um, the 344,115 uh, that's in, in the LCIP you've seen today. That's a 6% increase from last year. Remember, most communities are seeing 20 to 30%. I, I don't know where that'll leave us. We'll only know next spring. But that's something we ought to always make sure that's, that's, in our, that's in our, on our horizon. So that was just kind of an overview of kind of the changes we're looking at. Um, they sound subtle, but I think they're relatively significant and really stretch our program uh, well into the next 10 years. I think, I think some of you had experienced this, that the, what I've experienced the last few years is people see a street being paved and they go and look on our street inventory and see what the condition, what the rating of that street is and that street's a 74 and their street's a 74 and how come that street's being paved and not this street? Uh, and we've always had difficulty in, I think, effectively answering that question. So that was one of the charges I gave Dale was to come up with a system that we, where we could explain ourselves to the public in a way that it makes sense to them and, and they can understand why some of these decisions are made. Not that we're going to always satisfy everyone uh, because those ratings will be out there and at times we'll be doing one street and not another street, but at least trying to have some algorithm logical approach we're taking so that we can easily explain ourselves to, to the constituents who sometimes are out there scratching their heads. You know, I mean, I had, we did uh, part of Alfred Plur Parkway this year. We had people contacting us saying, why are you doing that? That street was okay. The street was okay, but it was at the point where it was going to really deteriorate quickly and turn into another scab street like uh, Lincoln Street was when huge chunks of pavement just started popping off. So we prevented that problem. But then people say, well, how come you didn't do my street, which is in much worse shape? So I think having this mix of, of traffic volume and the, the nature of the street and trying to look at new ways of dealing with it. Street I'm on, I'm, I'm on one of those cul-de-sac streets. I'm on a really short cul-de-sac street because there are only four driveways on my street. My rating is in the 20s or top mm -hmm. teens. I think. If he came out to pave my street, I'd shoot him. We have not polled the other residents of that street yet. Because the street is <laughs> perfectly workable. You know, it's got a low rating because it's lost a lot of its asphalt. You can see the stone in it. But, you know, there are literally four houses served by this street, and it doesn't make sense to spend a huge amount of money on a street that's perfectly functional as is, even with a low rating. When we do get to do something on a street, maybe it's just put a small, put a shim on it hmm. and have it hold up for another 10 years. So... So one of the things I've charged my staff with is as we, especially development of next year, as we, as we work our way up from the bottom and we skip a street because we expect to do a water line in two years, or as we pull a street in higher, like Alfred Plot Parkway, that, that's, that, that, they, that they begin to document it. So that it's very quick and easy when you call and you want me to come out and visit with somebody, we can talk about it. Or if we start bundling and, yeah, so we didn't hit your, your area of the city this year, but next year, our plan is to bundle in this group of group of streets, and we're going to get them all when we get them. So I, I think we'll have good answers and at least a good rationale for each of them. You uh, you speak of uh, that that if we went in and you know started this program, you would increase uh, the mileage a little bit. Uh, but in the long run, do you see savings from shifting to this type of program? I actually see savings from the beginning, and I think a couple things. I think if you look at when we add those, and, and it, there's, it's going to get lost in that, in, that, in that inflationary increase. So let's talk as if that doesn't exist right now, that 20 to 30 percent. I believe um, when I, what we're recommending is actually less than, not by a lot, but a little bit less than the consultant was recommending. Remember, the consultant was around 1.1 million, we're a little, I mean 3.1 million, we're a little under that right, right now. And I think as we develop over the next year or two or three, and we start looking at those light treatments, and some of my staff gets comfortable with them, because they're not very comfortable with them right now. They want to do the right thing every time and not have to come back there for 20 years, and I get wanting to do that. But there are cases where we're probably going to do, and Ed described a great example of that, where we may come out and do a skim coat, and we may say we're going to come back in 12 or 13 years, but it's a third or a fifth of what, or 10 years. And I think once we get into that 
get into that kind of groove, I think we're going to save some. We're also going to save a, a significant amount, I think, by at least in this program, not overall, but, but putting um, the utility work back in the utilities. And especially if it's above 55, the street's in good condition. Why is it coming out of street maintenance? It's really a utility project. What I don't want to do is get back to just paving the trenches. We're going to stay with at least paving half width at a minimum, maybe full width, but, but making sure we're not in that. I think most of you have been down those streets where you know, there's a utility trench that weaves up through, and that's the best pavement on the whole street, but it's, but it's uneven. So when I it, think we it, will be safe. When it comes to the utility, though, I would suggest that we actually try to look further down the road so that we're doing paving and utility purposely at the same time versus one picking up the other because we don't want to shift the cost to utility work. I think that incentivizes our utility group, which is in my group still, you know, but incentivizes them to do just that. And I think they have been to some extent, but it certainly incentivizes them more to, uh, to try to coordinate and, um, and pick and choose. The trouble is on some of the improvements, Ed talked today about water um, upgrading from um, the old um, cast iron to the ductile steel cement line water distribution pipes. The trouble is now we're getting to a place, and maybe we didn't take that approach 10 years ago, now we're getting to a place where um, those streets, the ones that are left, may also be some of the streets that aren't in that bad a condition. So, uh, but, but you're absolutely right. We should, we should get those two, dia those two Venn um, diagrams to overlap to the best, best they can. Yeah, one, so. one of the realities is underground utilities and streets are a horrible thing for the street. Mm -hmm. uh, every time you cut a street, whether it's just for a house service line or it's a gas line or a water line or any of that stuff, you have taken years off the life expectancy of that street, no matter how careful you are about repairing it. And quite honestly, in the current system, when a private utility does that, we cannot really recover those costs. All we can do is make them pave and, and repair to our, to our standard. But even, even if they do it perfectly to the standard, that street has lost life expectancy because it's now got a weak spot. And water will find a way, and other problems will arise, or it will differentially heave. I mean, we've all had that experience where you have a, a, a project done, and every time you're driving down the street, every, at every house you go kathunk, 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 because every time they did a, a, a house line uh, reconnect, they did not backfill with the same material and it differentially heaves. But sometimes it's better, and that's why those are the best sections of the street, right? right? They should so, be the same, not better. So there's an argument to be made to looking toward a utility to at least recover some of those costs of the, of the lost life expectancy of the street. Councilor Ray. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple questions. So um, the list is available online. Is that updated with the 2019 data? The 2019 one will be in the next couple days. Next I've got couple a couple days. corrections okay. to make on Excel's work. Um, also taking into consideration, just because my neighbors and I have been experiencing this, but construction accelerating the degradation of roads. Um, I mean, we've had so many heavy that's trucks fair. up and down Barnwell recently, um, and that's been a big complaint that I've passed along to you a few times. Um, and then the third thing was, um, our, it does cost more for this to be night work once we contract it out in order for businesses, especially in the downtown area that I represent, to be accessible during the day? Um, and is that being accounted for in the 20 to 30 percent increase? So that's, that's another whole discussion that we should definitely talk about. It is not accounted for in these costs okay. today. Um, it is more expensive. There are times, but I also think, as you, you and I had that experience, I think um, getting out ahead of our projects better and understanding. I think even though we did a little bit of that during the day over on Middle Street, it was a Middle Street project with Guthrie's, um, I think having that conversation with him and being sensitive to and trying to manage our project in a way that minimizes seemed to, seemed to go a long way with him. And some are going to have to be at night, partly due to that, partly due to traffic. Um, but I, th I think we want to be careful not making too many at night just because we'll erode the savings. We're probably going to get out of some of the improvements we talked about today. Did you end up making those uh, businesses still open signs for the end of the street? I think we did out there. Okay. I think we that's a, a good compromise, too, so thank you absolutely. for doing that. Councilor Pettengill. Um, so I wanted to say thank you. This presentation was fantastic. I loved it. Um, just a few, a few things. Um, are we tracking the metrics of how people are moving throughout the city 
um, whether or not it's uh, car, bus, bike, pedestrian, car share, um, any of that stuff, because that, that may be some useful metrics going forward. Um, Lewiston, as it is right now, is designed to move people out of the city. Um, it's not very well designed to encourage shopping or any of the other trips that will benefit our economy. Um, you know, so we, we want to um, take a look at Take, take a look at that uh, because if we're uh, forcing usage and demand on the streets, it's only going to increase our paving budget as it has, you know, statistically time mm -hmm. over time. Um, you know, and looking at a, a TOD model, the transit-oriented development versus auto-centric development. Um, but this seems like a much better uh, management system mm -hmm. and philosophy, and it's actually going to take a look at um, – taking care of our, our streets as it has you know over the last year um, just the amount of work that I've seen driving through the city is leaves and bounds um, an improvement 100% um, you know and it it's we're moving away from just putting a band-aid on top of a band-aid on top of a band-aid um, so thank you welcome well, maybe Dennis can speak to transit. I think one of the things, and we'll we'll come around to this when we get to the, some of the budget, and we'll talk in a little bit about um, sidewalk uh, maintenance and the crossing program that Ed talked about today. Um, one of the things we did do a, cro uh, a, um, a crosswalk study a while ago, we focused on arterials and, and how we improve arterials. One of the things that it didn't take into account, and maybe something we want to talk about in the next year or two, is really source and destination. Um, centric study for pedestrians. You know, if we're looking at arterials, most of our schools aren't on arterials. They're on some of the streets we talked about earlier today, like Jefferson and, and you know, some of, the, some of the parks and some of the, the mosque on, um, on uh, up, beyond, up beyond my um, office on, on, on uh, Bartlett. I, I, I think we gotta, I think we gotta take another look at how pedestrians move through the city from a safety standpoint, but more from a, from a um, generator um, destination perspective, not just simply getting people across Ontario. Right. Yeah, well, some, some communities have looked at exactly that. They've tried to identify pedestrian zones or pedestrian areas. So you look and try to identify attractors mm -hmm. where people might <clears throat> be interested in walking, whether it's um, <clears throat> a school or a shopping center or, you know, could be a, a facility like a church or a mosque and identify those as, as pedestrian areas and then look at them to see what the problems and issues are associated with them. And the housing that is associated with that, you know what? Other questions, comments? All right, thank you. Uh, agenda item number four. Oh, no, I'm sorry, three. Uh, East Avenue Lane reassignment. So we'll, I'll be much briefer here. Um, this is really just an early update. You also have in your packet um, this PowerPoint, partly because um, there's a couple, um, Council um, Khalid had asked for a diagram, so I just gave you my PowerPoint. So um, several years ago, um, looking at East Avenue, East Avenue needed to be repaved, the, the, the end between, um, pretty much between, um, home field up to, um, to fail on. Um, that was programmed with, with DOT and it was kind of looking at a couple of things. A lot of it was paving, but the sidewalks were getting in a, in a place where they really need to be re rehabilitated back to the last conversation. Um, but there were also some safety concerns. And typically we look at the last three years of uh, crash data. High, high accident locations are um, eight or more accidents in the last three years or a critical rate factor above one. A critical rate factor is really looking at other roads like that and is more likely or less likely to, to have crashes than similar roads. Um, when they looked at it at the time, there were a number of rear ends along, this, along a segment of this project, at least from home field up to um, Russell. And it was originally programmed with, so the project was rehabilitate the pavement, rehabilitate the sidewalks, maybe look for opportunities for pedestrian crossings and um, see what could be done about some of those crashes. During the period after that, the year or so after that, um, one year data fell off, there were less rear end crashes. So we kind of shifted a little bit of that, 
lane reassignment or the discussion about how we reduce those um, rear end crashes a little bit. Uh, more recently, the 2018 data came out and there are so a few of those are back again. And um, we also met recently with the uh, Complete Streets Committee um, and they also would ask us to focus on uh, taking a look at that segment and see if there's something we could do. Um, like I said, the project is funded with DOT. Um, it's a DOT project. We have a 10% match. I think I told you most of it. The target dates for, for the actual construction, construction estimates around 1.1 million, and the target dates um, calendar year 22 or 23. So again, this is very preliminary. Design is just starting, but we wanted to give you an, an up, a little update so you know understood um, maybe what we are contemplating. The second chart shows the segment that, that, that we were just talking about with the, not the entire segment, but the segment, maybe some, maybe we ought to look at some, um, how we might manage rear end crashes. So one way um, is to convert that from a, um, a three lane through lanes to two through lanes with a center, center turn, ramp, turn lane, two way center turn lane. Uh, so if you went out there today, there are two lanes going northeast and there's a single lane going southwest. So it's kind of a asymmetric um, arrangement. One of the proposals that we're beginning to evaluate and, and look at what that might have to do with the crash data and a couple other things is this two through lane with a center turn lane. The advantage is there is obviously there's a protected area for people that are taking lefts. It sometimes will improve mobility. It certainly will in the southbound direction and it may even in a northbound direction because someone in the morning that's going north and that wants to turn left against that kind of tide of opposing traffic is gonna, people are gonna sit there for a little while, right? Or they're gonna weave from one lane to another. Other potential advantages to this are it tends over the country, um, people have seen a couple mile an hour um, reduction in speed because it's a little less comfortable. You know, drivers drive to that comfort, not to the speed limit. If anybody here believes most drivers drive to the speed limit, um, we probably need to go for a ride. People drive to their comfort, and <coughs> that's why most traffic engineers use the 85th percentile of traffic speeds to set the speed limit where they can unless there are other issues. Another um, maybe side benefit people see in some locations, you know, if you're a pedestrian crossing those three active lanes when it's busy, it's three full active lanes. Even though I wouldn't say the center turn lane is a pedestrian refuge, it's certainly a less active lane um, and the pedestrian has less to contemplate. And we're gonna talk about uh, maybe an improvement there. There is one, at least one crossing with uh, flashing RFBs that Ed talked about, maybe that we would uh, install halfway up the corridor at Newman, because uh, there are no crossings there at all today. And then we'll, we'll look for other opportunities as well. If Ed goes to the next chart, you'll see, um, well, you didn't turn that on me, I thought you turned it on me. If you um, start at the bottom, kind of the orange, it's around 13,000 cars a day. So 13,000 cars are traversing that section. As you go north to the yellow, it's about 3,000. It drops off a lot at, um, at College, again at um, Sabatis, and again at Russell, and then north of that, it's pretty much a, a, a moderately used segment. Um, we think when we do the traffic studies, those volumes are things that can be um, uh, managed with a three lane segment, but that's there's some more traffic study that we need to do uh, along those. Yeah, gen gener generally, three set three lane sections are thought to be workable up to up to twenty thousand ADT. And where this is this is <clears throat> asymmetric, we, that's part of what we got to look at. You know that it's not the same in both directions. So Ed's absolutely right on a on a generally balanced corridor. That's true. But is this corridor in balance? And, and, and we need to do a little more work there. I, I, don't, I don't know at this point, but that is absolutely right. So we're looking at that three lane section as we talked about, see if that'll um, mitigate some of the crashes. The crashes are still a little bit, um, aren't as telling as I'd like to see them. There are a couple crashes, there are eight crashes at college, there are 18 at, um, at Sabatis. The eight at college, a couple could certainly be attributed to not having a, a left turn pocket. Some, some may not be. Some may be um, something else altogether. There are some odd crashes there. Some people have left the roadway without, without good explicable cause. 
campus? What's that? Do you mean campus app? I'm sorry, Sylvia. I meant campus, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Did I say college? Yeah. I was working on college earlier. I do that a lot. Oh, sorry. Please. At campus, yes. Yes, thank you. So another thing we're taking a look at is how would that work when we get to Sabatis? So um, if you, that's what it looks like today. Looking at that um, from the south, if you're traveling northeast, there are two through lanes that go through the intersection on the east and continue and are received by two lanes. There's a right turn lane, protected right turn onto, uh, onto Sabatis. Mm -hmm. Coming from the north, south, um, there's just a single lane and that accommodates all movements, right, left, and straight through. And, and that is a very bad location if somebody's taking a left-hand turn onto Sabatis from the right aid side of the street. It's, it's, it, is. You, it immediately stops all traffic. So, to a good, good transition, Ed, if we'll go to the next slide. <laughs> Having been stuck there, I can Perfect. talk about it. I like the testimonies, thank you. <laughs> so let's start in the north, because that's probably the place um, now that we've come to. One of the thoughts, and we've got to look at a couple things, and I'll explain what we need to look at there. One is more detailed to those 18 crashes. <coughs> but one thought is if we're going to have a center turn lane through, that would accommodate, coming southbound, a left turn pocket. Instead of having a single lane, that, um, that needs to accommodate all three movements, you'd have that left turn. Those people that are, are bothering Ed because he can't get through are gonna slide into that I'm left turn. I'm usually the pocket. one blocking traffic. Oh, you're the one blocking traffic. <laughs> the people you're bothering, you'll be able to slide into a left pocket and the right and straight through should continue. I'm gonna come back to that in a second about the signal. Coming from the south, instead of having um, two, um, two through lanes, the left two sides, and then the right turn lane only, um, we'd have a single through lane to, to match the rest of the corridor. Um, we'd have a left turn pocket again, and a left turn only pocket, and a, and a right turn pocket. So again, um, people that are, are not able to get through the intersection um, because of left turn in the morning, especially when a lot of people are coming in or coming south in the afternoon when a lot of people are going the other way, there's an ability for at least one or two or three cars, and we haven't got those tapers worked out yet. Question is, there's a couple questions with this though. One has to do with, a, a couple have to do with the signal. One is just the synchronization of that signal with the next two, right? There's one at Russell, and then there's one at Fairlawn. Uh, that one drives me nuts, but there's two signals right back to back. If, if this requires a separate left turn phase, that's, there's probably some consideration on can those, how can we, how can we maintain that synchronization in a way that, that allows um, Sabatis to, to work well? If we think, and when we do the counts, and if we think we can accommodate those left pockets without, and they'd just be yield on green like everywhere else, um, then we don't have to change the signal. That keeps the cost down. We don't have to change the synchronization. We don't have to add a phase to, to, to monkey with the others. Our hope is we'll be able to add those and they'd just be simple left. They'd just be storage pockets. So that's kind of kind of what we're thinking about for that. Again, very, very early on, very preliminary. So you'll be bringing more studies or we will, forward we will, at some point? We will bring back the design we get to PDF. When do you expect so. that, roughly? I think probably it'll be a um, better part of a year. Okay. By the time, because shooting for 22 or 23. Question Another one we probably really should talk about at some time when we get a little farther along is Main Street. You know, there's a main project from the bridge that extends all the way out to <coughs> um, beyond um, that end of Russell Street. Okay. Council of Joy. So yes, how about uh, on the corner of Russell and Sabatis when you're heading up towards Sabatis and you want to take a left-hand turn, uh, it holds up traffic quite a ways all the way to East Avenue many times From because Russell? there's no light or, you know, an arrow to turn. If you're tra traveling Russell and then want to go out Sabatis, is that? No, if you're on Sabatis heading out heading out towards Old Green Road, we'll say, mm -hmm. and you want to turn left onto <coughs> Russell Street. Mm -hmm. oh. There's no arrow there. So cars are waiting there, and many times you have a line quite a ways back. back. Well, I, can I think signaling right there would... Certainly don't have a project there, but we can certainly look yeah. at that. Yeah, that, that. That is a problem. It's a relatively rare movement. I think most people coming from, out, from downtown who want to get over to Russell Street tend to go out on, to turn on east. Yeah. 
That's up to good. Russell and go that way. But you're right, there, there are periodically people who want to turn left at, uh, from east on to Russell, every one of which I say, why didn't you turn yeah, right. <laughs> at East yeah. Avenue? I mean, the only other way would be to put a sign up there that says no left turn. <laughs> you know, that would stop them from having to turn there. They'd have to turn on East Avenue, but you know, the again, other, you'd be the restricting other, the flow. Oh, they're going to have to go down and turn around and come back. Yeah, the other problem with that, that intersection is the most congested intersection in that stretch because of all of the traffic coming off Russell turning on to Sabatis. So adding another cycle to that light would make it uh, potentially create more of a backup problem on Russell, particularly in rush hour. Mm. And it would probably impact this intersection as well. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Councilor Pettengill. Maybe better Wayfair and signing yeah. might help too. Um, so my, my question was just on the, the concept. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like you said, we don't have a lot of data on the crashes, um, but I'm curious what's causing them, whether or not it's the light cycle, um, road design, because you, you talked about how um, people drive slower on narrower roads, and it, that seems to help a lot of things. Um, you know, because I, I drive that every morning and every evening, um, and the turning lanes, I, I don't know what people would be turning to them because the the only issue that I, that I encounter heading home traveling down East Avenue towards Russell is people trying to turn into Rite Aid uh, or uh, Walgreens um, <coughs> across the traffic um, but other than that on the other side of the road there's nothing really for, pe for people to turn into minus the Noria and they don't even encounter using that shared turning lane there because it's set up yeah. after the turn in for that there are some turning movements onto some of the side streets though right yeah, yeah but i don't i don't know if that would generate enough traffic because you you said that there was a threshold um for the shared turning lane where it's no longer effective and it was like twenty thousand. yeah when, when you generally speaking if you have twenty thousand average daily traffic counts or more uh going from four lanes to a three lane section is not always impossible, but more difficult. Yeah. Some instances it may work, in some instances it may not. Because I know. At this level, it should work, but again, I think as, as Dale mentioned, we need to have, probably have a better idea of inbound, outbound counts. Yeah, on and the data. Ed's, and Ed's talking about <clears throat> through lanes. When you start to get into the intersection, it may drop down to around um, uh, 900 in the peak hour, and there's, there's some other things when you get to an intersection that are different than. You know, especially a signalized intersection. Yeah. I was just looking at the crash data. You asked about that. There, it's all over the place. The vast majority of the crashes there are um, are side swipes. So it's everything from people coming out of, um, coming up East Avenue, turning left onto, uh, onto Russell. I mean, onto Savatis there, and then people coming across from those from those, uh, from that southbound lane. Uh, yeah. There's a whole bunch where I think just people are not yielding to oncoming traffic appropriately for whatever oh. reason. Yeah, and it's all and it's in all directions. They're all over the place. And how how old is the data? And I I only ask because we lost Elizabeth Ann's on that corner, which could it could be a big factor. What's in front of me here? I mean, we can pick out any year you want or any time frame. This happens to be the, la uh, the last three years. Yeah, the last of the three years is 2018, so that would have still been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the Wall Green entrance is going to be that's probably um, an issue here for a long time. Yeah, it's just too darn mm -hmm. close and there's no good way to move it back because right. no one of the property. one of the problems coming on on to Sabatas from the wall green side is that if you're making a left hand turn there it's very easy to get confused because somebody in the center lane coming at you may be turning left right. you may have blocked visibility of a car coming through or you may not even be thinking the car is going to come through and the next thing you know you're turning figuring you've got a clean shot and a car comes up that curb lane, that curb through lane, and go keeps going straight. Yeah. Although it'll cause other problems, I think the center turn lane, the left turn pocket, will create a little bit of a refuge for that too. Right? It'll give just a little more space out there. Yeah, and something. It's not going to be great, up, but it's better. <laughs> Councilor Shalinas. I was reading in the document dated January seventh, um, Mr. Dowdy, that you talked about. The, the site visit that happened in 2019 by the the group that you know um, the design consultants and they actually were not encouraging mm. forward movement with this project. Can you speak to that a little bit? 
Yeah, I think there was a couple reasons for it, and, and there, th those exist all through the city. One of their biggest concern was, and it goes back to the, one of the first graphics, is the short segment. This whole corridor, and, it, and I, I think that's one of the things we should talk a little bit about. This is paint, right? right. We're going to paint the same width that we painted if it were a three-lane section. Right. We wear our paint off every year. We can always change it. But one of their concerns really was um, that the whole corridor wasn't going to be three lanes, that it was really from home field north. Mm -hmm. Now, as we pave going south um, over time, I think that's something we can look at, or we can look at adjusting it backwards. But theirs was, was really people getting confused over lane assignments. Mm -hmm. um, Ed and I were talking the other day about- if you, um, if, you, if you made the change at Webster, yes, and you had two lanes going up to Webster on east, Yep. make the, right, the curb lane a right turn only, yep. then you make the transition on the other side of Webster, then you've got a clear shot and it's not trying to make a lane adjustment in the middle of a block where you've got two lanes going to one, it's a forced right and everybody goes through. Right. A number of years ago we had somebody uh, looking a complete streets manual done uh, by a consultant and they looked at the entire stretch of East Avenue and recommended all of it go to three lane because it's got relatively low traffic volumes. And quite honestly, it's been probably massively overbuilt mm -hmm. in the section by the high school. Mm -hmm. That's an awfully wide street for a relatively limited amount of traffic, uh, except for maybe first thing in the morning when everybody's backed up at the school. But that can be, you can deal with those kinds of situations on a wide street like that with a three lane section. So it's something we should look at for the whole corridor, but you, there's a lot of them in the city. Main Street goes from three to four to two, right? And, and it goes back. So um, I think if we're the, the, the appropriate signage and the appropriate transitions, I, I, don't, I don't think it's gonna be as big a deal as, as their concern. Council Jensen. Um, yeah, I see a lot of benefits to the changes uh, recommended here. Um, initially, just kind of looking at this and seeing it presented, the things that come to mind for me, uh, similar to what Councillor Pettengill was talking about, if some other development does happen at the Elizabeth Ann site, how's that going to change uh, you know, the traffic? Um, and I'm, I'm probably wrong about this, but in my mind, I'm imagining the stretch between, uh, for East Ave, between Sabata Street and Russell Street to be, it might, it might be longer than I'm actually thinking it is, but I just worry that traffic is going to back up there in the morning with the traffic going to a Montello school as well. Um, so hopefully the traffic study can alleviate that. And I know uh, particularly the intersection of where campus meets uh, East Ave. I know a lot of the accidents there happen just because people don't want to wait for traffic and they just gun it real quick and they're flipping their car or something. <laughs> so I don't necessarily know that a, a turning lane is really going to stop people from doing that. But again, um, getting more information about the crashes themselves may Certain things that. engineering can't fix, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And we won't mention what those are. Any other uh, questions or comments? Councilor Khalid? Um, so during the morning, during the rush hour from the Lewiston High School, one of, there's two exits. The first one has a light, but the other one does not. Does, does this plan take care of that? Doesn't Especially when it. you're um, taking a left turn from the other exit. It, some, it's very dangerous, like dropping my brother off. I see people almost getting into car crashes. So um, with this concept. This doesn't go down that far, but that's something we can certainly look at for the next yeah. segment. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Gender item <coughs> number four this time. <laughs> thank you. Uh, proposed fees and penalties. Utility folks, you know, you can, yeah, that's important. <laughs> we, we covered this somewhat at the uh, meeting where the ordinance itself was introduced. That ordinance that covers all of this will be back for a second reading and final passage on Tuesday. And as a part of that, that ordinance does call for certain fees and penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, the fees that we're recommending here basically are the fees that the Federal Communications Commission has indicated they consider to be safe harbor fees, um, not, not uh, excessive to the point where uh, the utility would have an issue or be able to, to take action against the city. But the basic fees are $500 for up to five facilities, either five separate telephone poles, if it's a pole, or five separate um, small cell installations, if it's just the small cell on top of a pole, uh, with another $100 for each additional uh, permit, that each additional installation that comes in on the same permit. So a utility could literally come in with, you know, 10 small cell applications. They'd pay 
$500 for the first five and then another 500 for the next five. Uh, in terms of penalties, most of the penalties that we're recommending are $100 a day uh, with a couple of exceptions. One is a much more significant fine for them placing a pole in a sidewalk in violation of the ADA right. requirement. That would be a fine of $1,000 uh, and an additional fine of $1,000 every 10 days thereafter until it's fixed. So that's really an effort to try to get that resolved up front. Hopefully it won't happen anymore, but if it does, it'll get taken care of quickly. And then <clears throat> there's a $500 fine for, um, oops, excuse me, yeah, $500 fine if they have not met our notice requirement to relocate poles for a construction project uh, so that they're not still in the way. But that's basically what we're recommending. As a general fine, there are some things that aren't specified. The general fine would fall to the state standard. The state standard is basically a fine of anywhere from $100 to dip per day to $2,500 per day. Normally, uh, when you're in a situation like that, you end up negotiating a consent agreement that uh, results in a, in a reasonable fine and an agreement to rectify. I think that would be re relatively unusual in this circumstance. Most of our problems come from misplacement of poles, failure to correct a problem with a pole, once it's been pointed out, uh, those kinds of things. Besides the, uh, I'm sorry, besides the fine, are they charged with the repairs as well? Yes. Okay. It's their responsibility to repair. Mm -hmm. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Would this fee schedule apply to poles that already exist in the right of way, like the one between uh, Shamit and Howe on Ash Street? Or would this, would that kind of be grandfathered in? Everything that's out there already is grandfathered in. So the only time they would have to apply for a new pole permit is if they're putting in a new pole. They can replace an existing pole. If they replace it in the same place, there's no additional charge. So it's only new things or what I'd call expansions. So if they want to put a bit larger pole in or if they want to move it a little bit, they would have to probably get a new permit. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, thank you. Oops. Sorry. Um, so if this is approved at the second reading next week, uh, the ordinance goes into effect 30 days after, is that correct? 30 days. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Under item number five, the uh, proposed lease with uh, main drug enforcement for office space. I'm going to let Heather do this because she tells me there have been a couple of minor changes. Yes, um, as part of the FY20 <coughs> budget, um, the council at the time agreed to rehab some of the space at the vi former Violations Bureau on um, Park Street. And part of that occurred because the state had provided notice that they no longer wanted to um, be tenants in that facility. So part of the utilization of that space is with the main drug enforcement agency. Um, the state and the city both like to have leases. Um, in your copy of the lease, you actually have a section 10 and 11 um, the state's initial draft to me had section 10 and my goal of protecting the city said, okay, if they want to, you know, and hold us and have us bear all the burden of risk, I want them to have some risk as well. So you have, I inserted 11. We've both agreed that instead of trying to each indemnify each other and hold each other harmless, that we're going to remove those paragraphs completely. Um, so both 10 and 11 have been removed. Their um, legal counsel and risk management has approved it already. They know this is going before the council um, at the next council meeting. The other piece that has been changed is on section eight, letter E, or paragraph eight, section E. Um, adding uh, anything after the word, word material, so removing liability, property, workers' comp, insurance coverage, and certificates naming the city of Lewiston and, as additional insured. Um, if we would require that, then we'd have to furnish the state 
with the same information. So we both agreed just to rely on our own insurance binders to cover that risk management. So those have been the only two, cha uh, two changes. So the copy that you'll see in the actual council folder and in your packet before that meeting will have these changes in there. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Council Um So we're leasing 1,715 square feet of this space. How, will, how many square feet are in this unit? Uh, the building maintenance is still looking at having the total measurement. Did you, do you, you know either of you? Do you remember what the square footage is? It's like, it's all the land. Yes. I can get that we'll get for you. That. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. It's, this is a relatively small part of the building. I thought it was tiny, but okay. Compared to what the, the court system had, which was the entire two floors. Okay. And there has been some discussion uh, about maybe relieving space needs at the PD with some of that remaining building. Well, I think some of the chief is here, of course, but I think he, is the, uh, he has some intention of putting some of his officers over there. I suspect he's going to tell you it's not enough, but uh, that he still has other space needs that he can't accommodate in his existing building. But that's what this study we're involved in is going to start telling us. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so before we move to adjourn, I just uh, you know I want to acknowledge uh, some of the good work that uh, the chief and his command staff and his officers did after this weekend's incident. Uh, so just a lot of good work, some good, looked like some good solid arrests, and I know Ed, uh, you know, met with the chief, so I just, you know, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that. That was a tough case, so thank you, chief. One other thing I want to point out is I did put out uh, on your place this evening a little flyer from Maine Municipal Association. They do offer a training class for newly elected officials. Um, it's also open to pre-existing elected officials if they're interested might take a look at that they're going to be offering that class in Lewiston um, I think in March I forget the exact date 17th. and certainly if you're interested just let uh, me or Janet know and we will get you registered for that uh, that class it's it's my understanding that 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 meeting on the 17th of March falls on a council meeting night as well I missed part of that it's my understanding and looking at this invitation to this workshop on the 17th that that falls on the same night as a council meeting here is that correct uh -uh. yes okay there are other dates we'll get okay <laughs> we'll get you the list of the other dates and locations as well okay <laughs> all right thank you any uh, anything else before all right uh so remind me do i need a motion to adjourn and workshop thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> right. you just say we're done we're done. <laughs> Thank you.